Okay, so picking up with uh, pathogenesis here, again, pathogenesis is the process in which uh, microorganisms can cause disease. Uh, and again, there's five main steps involved in pathogenesis. First is finding a portal of entry. This could be through skin, GI tract, respiratory tract, your genital tract, or endogenous biota. Remember the endogenous means this is microorganisms that are currently living on your surfaces as part of your normal flora. The second step is attaching firmly and negotiating uh, the microbiome. And this will be through virulence factors called fimbrae, capsules, uh, surface proteins and viral spikes. Third step would be surviving host defenses. This would be avoiding processes like uh, phagocytosis or death inside a phagocyte or absence of specific community, uh, evading you know, hosts both innate and adaptive immune responses. Uh, third would be, um, I'm sorry, fourth would be causing disease or causing damage. Um, including direct damage via enzymes or toxins, inducing excessive host response, or causing epigenetic changes in host chromosomes. And then finally, the fifth stage of pathogenesis is exiting the host, and that's really a lot of the same ways that you entered into the host, uh, except that you would leave either respiratorily through saliva gland, salivary glands, skin, fecal matter, your genital tract, blood. And again, there's a lot of other ways you can either enter or exit as well. This is not a complete list. So looking at the portals of entry, um, this is a characteristic route taken by a microbe to initiate infection. It's usually through the skin or the mucous membranes and the source of infectious agent also plays a role. Exogenous means it's originating from outside the body, the environment, another person or an animal. Endogenous that already exists on or in the body. And this is part of your normal biota or previously silent infection. Uh, entering through the skin, this could be through a nick, abrasion, punctures, some tiny and inapparent. Intact skin is a very tough barrier. It's very good at its job, and very few microbes are able to penetrate that. Some infectious agents will create their own passageways into the skin using digestive enzymes. Through the GI tract, this would be entry through food, drink, or other ingested substances adapted to survive the digestive enzymes and abrupt pH changes, meaning that if this is an ingested organism, it has to be able to withstand those changes. Respiratory, uh, gateways to the respiratory tract include the oral cavity and nasal cavity, continuous mucous membranes covering the upper respiratory tract, sinuses and auditory tubes. Microbes are often transferred from one site to another. The extent to which the agent is carried into the respiratory tree is based on its size. Small cells and particles are inhaled more deeply than larger ones. The urogenital tract, um, this would be things like STIs, sexually transmitted infections, pathogens are transmitted by sexual means. They account for 4% of infections worldwide, 13 new million cases in the US each year. Entry points include the skin or mucosa of the penis, external genitalia, vaginal tract, cervix, and urethra. You can also get pathogens that infect during pregnancy and birth. The placenta is an exchange organ uh, between the fetus and the mother. Uh, it's formed by maternal and fetal tissues. It separates the blood of the developing fetus from that of the mother. It also permits diffusion of dissolved nutrients and gases to the fetus. A few microbes can cross the placenta and are spread by the umbilical vein into the fetal tissues. Other infections are transmitted perinatally as the child passes through the birth canal. Uh, and here you can see, you know, uh, placental transmission there. Uh, common infections to the fetus and the neonate uh, are what we typically look in a torch panel. All pregnant women will sort of go through this. They're looking for toxoplasmosis, other diseases such as syphilis, Coxsackie virus, varicella zoster virus, AIDS, chlamydia. AIDS would be HIV infections, rubella, cytomegalovirus, and herpes simplex. The most serious complications are the spontaneous abortions that result from any of these infections or uh, if the fetus does survive, you can have congenital abnormalities, brain damage, premature births, and stillbirths. So once you find a way into the host, the next thing is step two, attaching to the host. 
And this will occur by a few different mechanisms. First is adhesion. Adhesion is a process by which microbes gain more stable foothold on host tissues. It is dependent on binding between specific molecules on both the host and the pathogen. A particular pathogen is limited to only those cells and organisms to which it can bind. Once attached, a pathogen can invade body compartments. And we have what's called quorum sensing. This is chemical communication between nearby bacteria, critical to establishment of infections. And here we can see our host cell. You can see how the bacteria are using fimbrae. Those are structures that we talked about earlier on in the semester. And the fimbrae will actually help to adhere to the host cell. Capsules can also help with that. Remember viruses will have spikes. Spikes are what attach to the host cell membrane. Uh, and again, if you think of an uh, organ like the bladder where you get flushing action of urine, if E. coli, for example, which is something that tends to inhabit the bladder and cause infections, uh, if it was not adhering to that surface, it would get washed away. So part of the pathogenesis, part of the ability to cause infections is that it has to adhere. Uh, here's some more adhesive properties of microbes, some examples. Um, you know, you have Neisseria gonorrhea, uh, which has fimbrae that attach to the genital epithelial. You know, if you look at uh, HIV, HIV has viral spikes that adhere to white blood cell receptors. And again, these are all different types of examples. Now, step three is surviving host defenses. And phagocytes are white blood cells that are part of your immune system that engulf and destroy pathogens by means of enzymes and antimicrobial chemicals. There are antiphagocytic factors, virulence factors that are used by pathogens to avoid phagocytes. They can also circumvent some part of the phagocytic process. Step four is causing disease. Oh, and by the way, with phagocytosis, a capsule will actually prevent phagocytosis. Uh, that's another thing we talked about earlier on in the semester with phagocytosis and capsules. Step four is causing disease, virulence factors. Uh, these are going to be structures or products or capabilities that allow the pathogen to cause an infection in the host. Uh, they are adaptations that a microbe may use to invade and establish itself in a host and also to determine the degree of tissue damage that occurs. One example is by direct damage by enzymes. We have exoenzymes. These are secreted by pathogenic bacteria, fungi, protozoa, and worms. They break down and inflict damage on tissues. They dissolve host defense barriers, and they promote the spread of microbes into deeper tissues. Examples would be like mucinase, keratinase. Keratinase is gonna break down the skin Collagenase would break down collagen. So these are enzymes that are secreted by the bacteria that can cause direct damage. We also have toxins. Toxins are a potent source of cellular damage. A toxin is a specific chemical product of microbes, plants, and some animals that is poisonous to other organisms. You have exotoxins. These are secreted by a living bacterial cell to infected tissues, and there are many types of those. And then you have endotoxins. They're not actively secreted. They only get released when you uh, cause lysis of the cell wall. Uh, and we typically find those in our gram-negative bacteria. Here's a table that really just compares and contrasts exotoxins versus endotoxins. I would spend some time with this, look at the differences between the two, and make sure you understand the differences between the two. Uh, many cases of microbial diseases are the result of indirect damage of or the host excessive or inappropriate responses to uh, microorganisms, meaning sometimes the damage could be a result of your immune system sort of acting too hypersensitive. Pathogenicity is a trait not solely determined by microorganisms. Pathogenic pathogenicity is a consequence of the interplay between the microbe and the host, and we have different types of infections. Localized infection, this is when the microbe enters the body and remains confined to a specific tissue, such as fungal skin infections or wart or boils. Systemic infections, this is when an infection spreads to several sites and tissues, fluids, usually in the bloodstream. Uh, viral, this could be measles, rubella, chickenpox, HIV. Uh, bacterial, brucellosis, 
anthrax, typhoid fever, syphilis, fungal, histoplasmosis, or cryptococcosis. Uh, infectious agents can also travel by means of nerves, such as rabies or cerebral spinal fluid with our meningitis types of infections. And again, you've seen all these in unit three. A focal infection is when you have a local infection that has now manifested to a um, uh, systemic infection. And, you know, this could be something that happens in oral nasal passageways that eventually gets into the systemic system, could affect the heart, could affect bloodstream, so on and so forth, and you can get secondary site infections from there. Mixed infections, this is when several agents establish themselves simultaneously at the infection site. Uh, polymicrobial diseases will include things like gas gangrene, wound infections, dental caries, which are cavities, and human bite infections. Primary and secondary infections. A primary infection is an initial infection. A secondary one is one that results uh, when a primary infection is complicated by another infection caused by a different microbe. It's not uncommon, for example, if you have the common cold, uh, which is caused by viral infections, and if it's left untreated or prolongs for a period of time, you can actually end up developing, say, strep throat or more serious bacterial infection. That would be a secondary infection. Acute versus chronic infections. Acute infections come on rapidly. They have very short-lived uh, effects. Chronic infections progress and persist over very long periods of time. When we look at these infections, we look at typically signs and symptoms. A sign is any objective evidence of disease as noted by the observer, more precise than symptoms. A symptom, this is subjective evidence of disease as sensed by the patient. Syndrome, this is a disease that's identified or defined by a certain complex of signs and symptoms. Common signs would be a fever, septicemia, microbes and tissue fluids, cloudiness of tissue fluids, chest sounds, skin eruptions, uh, to name a few. Symptoms would include things like chills, pain, ache, soreness, irritation, malice, fatigue, chest tightness, headache, nausea, sore throat, uh, those would be symptoms. And again, it's a combination of these signs and symptoms. Um, Inflammation, inflammatory response is usually the earliest symptom of a disease where you're building up fluid or developing an abscess or possibly even lymphangitis. Signs of infection in the blood, leukocytosis, this would be an increase in white blood cell counts. That's why if they think you have an infection, they'll look at a blood cell panel. Leukopenia, this is decreased level in white blood cells. Septicemia is a general state in which microbes are multiplying in the blood and are present in large numbers. Bacteremia, this is small numbers of bacteria are not present in the blood, but not necessarily multiplying either. And then viremia, this is the presence of viruses in the blood, whether or not they're actively multiplying. Now, sometimes infections can go unnoticed. Asymptomatic or subclinical or inappropriate, inapparent infections. Uh, the host is infected, but does not manifest the disease patient experiences no symptoms or disease and does not seek medical attention. Most infections are not are attended by some sort of sign. And we're starting to see this with coronavirus. There are people, healthy individuals that are asymptomatic. That's what this would necessarily be a result of. So now once you've uh, sort of gotten in, you have adhered to the host surfaces, you've evaded host defenses and you've caused damage. With those four steps, step five is vacating the host by portals of exit. And the portals of exit you can have uh, for pathogens to exit the host would be secretion, excretion, discharge, or sloth tissues. So respiratory and salivary portals escape media for pathogens that infect the upper and lower respiratory tract, mucus, sputum, nasal drainage, and other moist infections or secretions. Skin scales, this is the outer layer of the skin and scalp is constantly being shed into the environment. Household dust is composed of skin cells. A single person can shed several billion skin cells a day. Fecal exit, some intestinal pathogens cause irritation in the intestinal mucosa that increases the motility of the bowel, resulting in diarrhea, provides a rapid exit for pathogens 
Helmuth worms release eggs and cysts through the feces, as well as feces containing pathogens are a public health problem when allowed to contaminate drinking, contaminating when you're looking at contaminated drinking water or when used to fertilize crops. The urogenital tract, agents involved in STIs leave the host through vaginal discharge or through semen. Source of neonatal infections that can in infect the infant as it passes through uh, the birth canal. You have herpes, chlamydia, can and albicans. Pathogens that can infect the kidney are typically discharged to the urine. You also have blood has a portal of exit when it is removed or released through vascular puncture. Blood feeding animals are common transmitters of pathogens such as ticks and fleas. We saw a few diseases that involve those vectors. Long-term infections and long-term effects. Latency is a dormant state of an infectious agent. Uh, during this state, a microbe can periodically become active and produce a recurrent disease. The agents of syphilis, typhoid fever, tuberculosis, and malaria also enter into latent stages. Sequela is a long-term or permanent damage to organs and tissues. Meningitis can result in deafness. Strep throat can lead to rheumatic heart disease. Lyme disease can cause arthritis. And polio, um, polio can produce paralysis. Sorry, guys. There we go. Sorry. Uh, so the course of infection, we have our, what's called the incubation period. This is the time from the initial contact with the infectious agent to the appearance of the first symptoms. The prodromal period, this is when the earliest notable symptoms of infection appear. The acute phase, this is the infectious agent multiplies at high levels. It exhibits its greatest virulence and it becomes well established in the target tissue. And then the convalescent stage, this is when the patient responds to infections and symptoms decline. And here you can see the stages in the course of infection and disease. Reservoirs, where do we find pathogens? Reservoir is the primary habitat in the natural world from which a pathogen can originate. Human and our animal carriers, soil, water, or plants uh, can act as reservoirs. We have various living reservoirs, animals, other humans, and arthropods can be directly transmitted to humans, can be transmitted to humans by vectors. Uh, actively ill humans, you can have indirect transmission when a person with a cold contaminates a pen and then that pen is picked up by a healthy person. Direct transmission is when one uh, uh, sick person, say, sneezes and then you inhale that. Uh, you know, again, a lot of this is, you know, very real for us today as we're living through COVID. Um, human carriers, a person who is fully recovered from his or her uh, hepatitis is still shedding hepatitis A virus and feces. Um, an incubating carrier of HIV who does not know she is infected transmits the virus through sexual contact. And you know, if you're, if you have something that's being shed through the feces and you do not wash your hands and somebody else that's healthy eats food that you prepared, uh, that's how that can be transmitted. Teas, ticks, fleas, uh, these are arthropods. They can transmit viruses as well. Uh, carrier states, a carrier is an individual who inconspicuously sheds, shelters a pathogen and can spread it without knowing. Um, and again, you can see some of the carrier states here. Uh, we have, you know, asymptomatic carriers, we have symptomatic carriers, we have incubating car carriers, convalescent carriers. So look at these different uh, examples here. Vectors in epidemiology, a live animal that transmits an infectious agent from one host to another. Um, majority of vectors are arthropods, a biological vector. Uh, this actively uh, participates in a pathogen's life cycle, serving as the site in which the pathogen can multiply or complete its life cycle. Uh, and then we also have mechanical vectors where not necessarily to the life cycle of the infectious agent. We also talked about some zoonotic infections in Unit 3. This is an infection indigenous to animals, but it was also transmissible to other animals, such as humans. Uh, rabies is a great example of a zoonotic disease. 
Non-living reservoirs, microbes have adapted to nearly every habitat in the biosphere, soil, water, air, the built environment, surfaces. Most are saprotic and cause little harm to humans. Saprotic means they break down organic material. Some are opportunistic. A few are regular pathogens. Um, but again, most are not going to cause infection. Um, how you acquire or transmit the infections agents. You have communicable disease. This occurs when an infected host can transmit the infectious agent to another host and establish the infection in that host. Uh, contagious, this is the agent is highly communicable, uh, especially through direct compact, contact. And then you have non-communicable diseases. This does not arise through the transmission of infectious agents. And this can be transmitted from host to host. Uh, you also have horizontal and vertical transmission. Horizontal, the disease is spread through a population from one infected individual to another. Vertical, the transmission is from a parent to an offspring. Indirect transmission, this is through some type of vehicle or fomite. Um, uh, for example, um, a vehicle would be any inanimate material commonly used by humans that can transmit infectious agents. Fomite would be an inanimate object that harbors and transmits uh, pathogens, not a continuous source of infection. Water, soil, and air can act as vehicles. Uh, if you've never seen a sneeze, there's a sneeze. You can get aerosolization. Uh, hospitals are a very large source of a lot of infections. Uh, Hospital-acquired infections can range anywhere from 0.1 to 20% of all admitted patients for a hospital. On average, it's about 5 to 7% of all admits to a hospital will develop some type of infection. Um, you know, surgery is a big one. Uh, if they're cutting you open, that is a major, major risk for a lot of types of infections. Most hospitals have infectious control officers, which will implement proper practices and procedures throughout the hospital. They are charged with tracking potential outbreaks, identifying breaches in asepsis, and training other healthcare workers in aseptic techniques. Epidemiology, this is a study of disease and populations. Uh, epidemiology, effects of diseases on the community. It involves the study of the frequency and the distribution of disease and the distribution of disease and other health related factors in defined populations. Reportable diseases, these are diseases that are notifiable diseases. By law, some diseases must be reported to authorities. Other diseases are reported on voluntary basis. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention are responsible for keeping track of infectious diseases nationwide. It's part of the US Public Health Service. They put out what's called the Morbidity and Mortality Report, which is a weekly notice of diseases published by the CDC. The Centers for Disease Control shares its statistics on disease with the World Health Organization for worldwide tabulations and control. And you know, here are some statistics. You can look over these terms, prevalence, incidence, mortality rates. Uh, these are all things that they typically will talk about. Um, and then the different types of epidemics. Uh, we're currently living in a pandemic, which you know is the spread of an epidemic across all continents. That's what the uh, coronavirus is. Um, and then um, you know you can also look at things such as you know something endemic, which means it's it's just part of that geographical region. Sporadic diseases. This is something that occurs occasionally uh, with no regular set pattern. Um, and, you know, you can sort of look at Lyme disease here. You can see sort of patterns and peaks that we see. Uh, and then I'll just finish on with some global issues in, new, in epidemiology. We're seeing increases in infectious disease and incidence. Newly identified microbes, uh, HIV in the 80s, SARS, novel strains of flu. Uh, we're living through one right now. The novel virus, that's why they're calling it the novel virus. This is a newly identified microbe. Uh, the particular strain, uh, COVID-19. Uh, and then we also see some things that reemerge, TB, dengue fever, yellow fever. Um, so you always get these new and emerging things, but also old things that sort of resurface. And that is the end of chapter 13.